this week. Um, veteran community moment speaker, um, sound guy. We wouldn't be able to do much without him. Fred Thompson, let's welcome him. This community moment is about the importance of life insurance, not from the viewpoint of our cognitive mind, which is the source of our rational thought processes, but from the viewpoint of our affective mind, which is all about our feelings. I believe it's our affective mind that motivates us to buy many products, especially life insurance. We buy life insurance because our affective mind views it as a source of financial security for our loved ones. And what we're really buying is the sense of well-being we get from knowing our loved ones are secure. This makes us vulnerable to fear-based advertising, as in the TV ad I'm seeing lately, where the character says, he died so suddenly, and he didn't have life insurance. How will they pay for the funeral? And all those credit card bills, what are they going to do? So imagine you're a single mom with two children. You have no living relatives, and the kid's father is no longer in the picture. So you are completely alone, and if something happened to you, your children would face a bleak and uncertain future. You've purchased a large insurance policy. If you died, the proceeds would go into a trust fund that would provide income, an income stream for the kids until they turn 21. There's even money to pay for their college education. If you were disabled and couldn't work, you'd continue to receive an amount equal to your salary. If you lost your job, there's loan provision. So you could borrow from your policy until you found another job and then pay it back. This comprehensive coverage gives you a great sense of security and well-being, not so much for you, but for your children. Then at a party, you run into your old friend, Lou Kana. And he tells you he's been, research, he's been researching ways to reduce living expenses. Luke didn't know I was going to talk about this. And his research included a review of insurance companies. He tells you he's learned that they're all fraudulent institutions. They're all scams, every one of them. He can, says he can document countless instances where a policyholder or a beneficiary filed a claim heard nothing from the company, and never received any money. He tells you he's canceled his life insurance because his policy was worthless, and he advises you to do the same. Lou has always given you good advice. You should have no reason to doubt it. So would you thank Lou and immediately discontinue those big monthly payments you're making to the insurance company? Almost certainly not. Instead, you'd be angry with him for causing you so much stress. You have a strong emotional commitment to your insurance. It's your kid's only protection if something happens to you. Your parents and their parents held policies with this company. You've heard countless testimonials from satisfied policyholders. Every Sunday morning, you attend the insurance company's weekly meeting. It's held in a beautiful building where people sing songs about the company, recite praises to its chief executive officer. Hey, this isn't funny. <laughs> recite praises to its chief executive officer and give testimonials about how they once had no insurance, then they found insurance, and their life has been transformed. <laughs> Attending the Sunday meeting gives you some reassurance, but you're still stressed about your conversation with Lou. You've even lost sleep worrying about it, and you need more reassurance that the insurance company will be there for you or your kids when you need it. So you schedule a meeting with your insurance agent. Your agent listens to your story and reassures you that it's normal to have some doubts from time to time. He also points out your friend Lou is obviously an insurance atheist who doesn't believe in insurance companies. And he warns you that it's best to stay away from people of that ilk. They will only cause you doubt and uncertainty. He agrees that many claims do go unanswered, but these are mostly with other insurance companies. These other companies are not true insurance companies, and their CEO is not a true CEO. He repeats what you've always been told. Yours is the tr one true insurance company, and your CEO is the one true chief executive officer. He also admits that some claims with your company may have gone unanswered, 
And it reminds you there are strict behavioral rules for policyholders. The CEO sees everything you do, and if you have violated any of the rules, he may deem you unworthy. He points out that you have two children by a man you were never married to. Sex outside of marriage is a grievous violation of the policyholder rules, and you must repent and vow never again to have sex until you've married a man who is a policyholder with the company. <laughs> Finally, he reminds you of something you've always been taught to believe. The CEO of the insurance company is a very wise man who knows what's best for you, and he has a plan for you. So if you file a claim and your kids don't receive any money, the CEO has something else for them that will give them even greater happiness than the money would have given them. Or maybe he's just testing your faith in the company. Okay, by now you may realize I'm not telling you some ludicrous and unbelievable tale about insurance companies. I'm talking about religion. The insurance company is any religious institution. The CEO is the god that religion worships. Your agent is your priest, minister, rabbi, or imam, depending on which faith you belong to. The policyholder rules are church dogma. Filing a claim is intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is that kind of prayer where we ask God for a favor. Receiving a monetary settlement is having your prayers answered. A few months ago, I did a community moment about the benefits of religion. And I said that the greatest benefit is that feeling of a certainty and well-being and security that comes from the belief that our prayers will be answered, that God will change the natural course of events in our favor. Our kids will pass their college entrance exam. Our loved one, who's been diagnosed with a potentially fatal disease, will respond to medical treatment and will enjoy a good outcome. I'll join Christian Mengel, and God will send me the loving husband or wife I've been longing for, but only if I'm not gay. <laughs> Intercessory prayer, asking God for a favor, is really big in our American culture. People really do believe it works. According to the Pew Research Center, 55% of Americans pray, American adults pray every day, and 75% pray at least weekly. 19% say their prayers result in definite and specific answers from God at least once a week. Another 31% say they receive direct answers at least once a month. So how well does intercessory prayer really work? Suppose I pray for something and my wish is truly worthwhile and not something superficial like asking God for a Mercedes Benz or if I'm a liberal asking for a new Prius. <laughs> How often are prayers really answered? Often, seldom, or never? My personal experience tells me never, but that's just my opinion. So what does the most scientifically rigorous research about prayer tell us? <coughs> Carefully monitored studies of prayer are relatively few. The field remains tiny with only about five million spent worldwide on this research every year. The largest and most scientifically rigorous study of prayer's efficacy was the 2006 STEP project, that's S-T-E-P, which is an acronym for the study of the therapeutic effects of intercessory prayer in cardiac bypass patients, a multi-center randomized trial of uncertainty and certainty of receiving intercessory prayer. The study found no significant difference whether subjects were prayed for or not except some negative effects among those who knew they were receiving prayers. Nobody knows why the test subjects who knew people were praying for them didn't do as well. In contrast to these findings, some other studies have indicated beneficial effects for prayer, but only where the subjects knew others were praying for them, apparently a placebo effect. Overall, there is no scientifically derived reason to believe that intercessory prayer works. You can't measure spiritual things, but you can measure physical things, like recovery from cardiovascular surgery. And whether you are prayed for or not, the studies indicate the outcome will be about the same. This community moment has been critical of certain religious practices, of a certain religious practice, intercessory prayer, but it's based on accessible, factual data, so I don't consider it to be gratuitous religion bashing. 
I presented this topic to encourage everybody here, regardless of your religious beliefs, to do only what we, we critical thinkers say we're committed to, using factual data and reason in solving problems and understanding the nature of the world around us. But don't believe me. Thanks to the internet, you can do your own research. You can read about intercessory prayer for yourself by Googling the words efficacy of intercessory prayer. Uh, like my theist wife, who is a former science teacher, who has an advanced degree and who graduated from a university summa cum laude, number one out of 750, you may read about the conclusions of the st studies that have been done and you still may value the security and comfort of your belief above the findings of rigorous scientific research. If this is your conclusion, I don't agree with it, but I still respect you and I encourage you to continue to pray if that works for you. In some ways, I'm no different from people who believe in prayer. I have a friend who is one of Houston's most dangerous drivers. I've been in his truck with him going 80 miles an hour, <laughs> weaving around other cars on the Sam Houston Tollway during Houston downpour. There's a strap above the passenger door on almost every SUV and truck. It's called the oh shit strap, because that's what I say as I cling to it as we're driving down the road, weaving in and out, and almost running into 18 wheelers. I need that false sense of security. Like the people who believe in prayer in spite of the evidence, I'm only human, so don't be critical of me or them for letting their affective minds drive their decisions. I thought about ending this community moment with a prayer, but that didn't seem to make any sense. So instead, I've chosen to end with an inspirational reading. We believe in optimism rather than pessimism, hope rather than despair, learning in the place of dogma, truth instead of ignorance, joy rather than guilt or sin, tolerance in the place of fear, love instead of hatred, compassion over selfishness, beauty instead of ugliness, and reason rather than blind faith or irrationality. Those are the words of Paul Kurtz from his Affirmations of Humanism. <clears throat>